and thank you for joining our panel presentation on the IoT. We have a, a great panel here for you today. I'm really looking forward to this. This is a panel that we've been working on and the content that we've been working on specifically for the Magnet Virtual Summit 21. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, well, quickly, uh, you have the bios on the webpage. So we'll skip the bios, but we'll go around the room and uh, the virtual room. Hopefully next year at the next Magnet, it'll be in a, in a real room um, like, uh, like in the past. Uh, but uh, we'll go around the virtual room and, and let the panelists introduce themselves quickly. Uh, my name is Warren Cruz. I'm a vice president with Concilio, a global electronic discovery service provider. Ken? Great, thanks Warren. Good afternoon, my name is Ken Oliver. I'm a senior director at Concilio as well. Good afternoon, my name is Norman Rankus and I'm a consultant and I've been in the business for 40 years. Hey everybody, uh, Patrick Bland here. I'm the CTO of Acres Technology. Looking forward to talking about IoT with you guys. Awesome, and I'm Trey Amick, uh, one of the directors here at Magnet Forensics for the Forensic Consultant team. Just wanted to thank, you know, Patrick, Norman, Ken, Warren, all of y'all for being a part of MBS 2021. And uh, Warren, thanks for having me on y'all's panel today. Looking forward to it. Uh, absolutely. Thank, yeah, let me echo that. Thank you all for the time putting this together. Um, I I really think it's, it's pretty good and uh, if I think you'll agree. We're going to start off really quickly with what is IoT so that everyone is on the same page. I still, you know, I've been tracking IoT for as long as I could remember, um, but I still find out things. And, you know, Norman and I were talking the other day and I found out um, new things that he's going to talk about. So just so everyone's on the same page, I'm going to ask Ken to take us through a little high level. Uh, what is IoT? Sure. Thanks. Thanks again, Warren. Again, I, the Internet of Things is generally described as a network of physical objects that are embedded with sensors, software and other technologies for the purpose of connecting and exchanging data with other devices and systems over the Internet. But again, the short answer is really anything that's connected to the Internet. And as you can see by some of these, uh, you know, examples, you know, it really does range from anything from, you know, home home equipment all the way through uh, enterprise and, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing devices and cars, etc. And, and when we talk about the Internet of Things, we want to talk about the growth and as we see things progressing over the next several years, um, you know, 55% of all data is forecasted to be generated by the Internet of Things in 2020, by 2025. Um, and again, as you can see by this chart, you can you can go forward, Warren. Um, and as you can see by this chart, again, just some examples of the numbers of devices that are out in the wild um, globally. Um, you know, it's just uh, some astounding facts. You know, fifty point one billion you know uh, door locks that are automated and have some type of interconnection to the internet or other systems. I mean, it's really interesting to see uh, how this has grown in the last 10 to 20 years. It's, it's kind of amazing. You look at how fast that's going up and, you know, we're at 50.1 billion at the top now. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's even gone from there as well. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the, the uses of IoT, some of the ways to collect it, some ways that it's being collected that you might not even know about. And that's one of the things that worries me, you know, as someone that, that does investigations, you show up and, you know, not to say that anyone on the, a magnet virtual conference would do this, but I envision, you know, at some point someone shipping me a, a uh, smart thermostat and say, hey, can you do forensics on, you know, this smart thermostat? Um, obviously, we hope that doesn't happen, but there's so much data out there and, uh, you know, kind of trying to keep track of it um, boggles my mind. And, you know, I have these what I call aha moments. Um, and this was 
one of my aha moments when I actually had more hair, which, you know, I need to edit this picture a little, take some of the hair out. Um, but uh, I was um, uh, studying uh, computer forensics, uh, doing a master's, actually I had my master's and my undergrad from Champlain. And I was on campus in their forensic lab, which if you ever have a chance to visit, it's a really cool place. They do a lot of, you know, cutting edge um, uh, research. And at the time, this was, I should know this one Did I get my degree. I don't know. I can't read my diploma at the time. But a few years ago, when, you know, the Google glasses were just coming out, uh, they were doing research on it. And, you know, I had this aha moment, and I started tracking IoT back then saying, hey, you know, we might need to collect this data at some point. Uh, my recent aha moment or, um, you know, the, the light bulb went off was um, two occasions. On the left there is a screen capture um, of my cell phone. And I got an alert from my security system saying the kitchen door was closed. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird because we weren't home. And I have some cameras around the house. Um, so I went to the videos thinking, you know, why is my door showing as closing when we weren't home at the time? And I noticed that I only had alerts being saved. Um, I didn't know that. I figured I'd be able to watch video going back, but you know, turns out you had to pay more for all the video to be stored. And that's when I had an aha moment saying, wow, you know, I wish I knew that before the alarm system said the door was closed. You know, why was it open? I don't know because there was no alert. On the right hand of this screen was my other aha moment. Um, I got a smart, and this is, you know, everything is smart. Everything is IOT these days. I got a smart humidor for my cigars. I, I like an occasional cigar. And um, even though my humidor has a glass front and I could literally look in and see what the temperature is, being a geek, I had to have this thing connected to the internet so I could like look at my cell phone anywhere in the world and know, you know, what my humidity and what my temperature is. But what I noticed was it, the device, the picture in the middle there, the, the device itself only keeps very limited information. But when you log in, and you're taken to the cloud, you could go back in time. And that was my second aha moment saying, oh man, again, you know, what if this was some cigar superstore that had millions of dollars in inventory and someone got in and, you know, either raised the humidity or lowered the humidity or the temperature and ruined millions of dollars worth of stock and someone sends me this humidor, you know, you only have a little picture here. The rest of the data is somewhere else. And that's what we're going to spend some time talking about. Where else might the data be? Ken? Can you mute it? Ken, I think you're on mute. The old double mute. <laughs> of course, sorry about that. Anyway, thanks, Warren, and, and thanks for giving us a couple of examples. But again, here we just wanted to, you know, for consumer or smart home products, we wanted to kind of cover the array of what's out there. And as you can see, again, you know, there's several different examples from, you know, refrigerators and thermostats all the way through, you know, outlets and door locks and home security. So again, we, this is just an understanding of showing how and where data may reside in, in typical homes. In typical homes, but um, when we're doing cases, there's also a lot of companies. Um, Ken's earlier slide showed, you know, how many enterprises are using IoT, and I wanted uh, Norman to talk about. He's a consultant that works with industrial IoT, and I wanted Norman. Um, 
to talk uh, a little bit about what he sees in industrial IoT. Well, industrial is at a boom right now. And I really need to stress that this seminar is for your benefit, for you to really uh, benefit with an understanding of how IoT or IIoT, industrial uh, Internet of Things, is rapidly uh, moving uh, at light speeds. Uh, within the manufacturing environment, you'll see from the screen that almost every aspect of a business process is being um, monitored through IoT devices. The question is why? And the answer is to reduce cost. Um, you can now start reducing the, you know, uh, man hours uh, in counting uh, electrical kilowatts at meters. You can now do that with IoT devices. So the, uh, tr the savings is tremendous. And when you look at a manufacturing world, the main goal is just not quality of product, but to do it at a very efficient cost. And so that's what you know, the IOT is, is doing for manufacturing. And so, again, I need to stress that every leader is a teacher and every teacher is a leader. So I'm asking the uh, uh, participants uh, of this seminar to take this information as educational so that it can improve your process when you're doing uh, forensics investigations. So if we can move on to the next slide, and a um, uh, disclaimer that I should have, I apologize, I should have started off with, um, we're all here, you know, on our own talking about um, information not, you know, specific to any company or any, you know, specific case. This is just for educational purposes, not our um, views of our companies, et cetera. So again, with the uh, smart factory, and you know, I read an article about a factory in Japan that has uh, probably about 95% of that factory running under robotics and IoT uh, devices. And so that basically is what my charge is uh, when I'm working with manufacturing companies, is to bring in a process that in which we can automate uh, and use uh, industrial Internet of Things. If we could change the screen, please. So how I categorize IoT is very similar to uh, grammar school. Uh, there are many types of IoT devices out there. Um, some what I call third graders, some are you know, 10th and 11th, 12th graders. Uh, right to the point, um, we'll have in a manufacturing environment, a device that does everything, that it itself is a computer, it will transmit certificates uh, and, of course, the digital data from the sensors that it has. But also, there's what we call programmable logic controllers, which are PLCs. Uh, there are manufacturing companies such as Rockwell International, Siemens, and the list goes on that have been producing PLCs for years. The key thing is that PLCs can be very uh, expensive. I've seen them range from $3,000 per uh, PLC all the way up to $200,000 for uh, PLC uh, networks. Um, again, those PLCs, I'm going to show you if you go to the next slide. They are, they are wired. So what we're looking here is we're looking at a NEMA box. And within that NEMA box, you'll see the uh, wiring to the PLCs those PLCs are actual computers themselves. Um, this, in this case, these uh, are, are Rockwell computer uh, PLCs. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you'll see we have a, a wireless uh, sensor. And that sensor could pick up on levels of fluid. It could pick up on temperatures or any sort of uh, variant that uh, you can think of. And also the... Uh, wireless uh, PLCs, they'll be connected to um, uh, a hard wire also uh, through uh, the uh, network to a NEMA box, which is hooked up to the PLC. So in the manufacturing environment, this is you know, very, very key, very important. And it also leads to issues. 
as I pointed out that PLCs are, you know, can be quite expensive. And we also pointed out that a manufacturing's goal is to keep a product of quality, but also to reduce the cost. So PLCs have to be upgraded just like Windows, Macs, et cetera. Uh, and so it can be very costly uh, to upgrade your PLC with the latest firmware. And unfortunately, uh, there are PLCs out there, and there's quite a few um, that are at end of life and have been end of life. And so for a plant to do a capital budget of multi-million dollars to exchange its PLCs, the upgraded ones, is a, a, a tremendous investment and also could be a hardship on the cost of their products. So if we could move on forward to the next slide. Uh, so here we see a uh, basically a PLC network. In this case, we're using a uh, water sensor. And that water sensor uh, can measure, you know, gasoline, could actually better just water. Uh, any type of liquid, uh, they exist in our battleships, aircraft carriers. Uh, and that PLC is hooked up to a computer or uh, in turn, that computer is what we call an HDMI. All right, it's a you know, human digital machine interface. And you'll see from the screen, it denotes um, what it's actually functioning. And in this case, it's looking at valves uh, and giving you a reading of data of those valves. Now, on a side note, we just recently had heard in the news and looked at the attack of the uh, sewage uh, water uh, sewage plant out in Florida. Uh, that was, they state, was done remotely uh, through a, uh, what we call, you know, a Teams uh, process, uh, could be a Bumgar uh, remote uh, software that's used internally. It was also cited that uh, the machine was an outdated Windows 7. Uh, so all those cases, you know, show that you need to have your network totally uh, up to date uh, with the latest, latest patches. Um, I think what's you know important is that you realize that this data, as Warren was pointing out, there's a lot of data. Uh, I'm working at one plant that we capture 5,000 IoT uh, type tags every 100 millisecond. So you can understand the you know terabytes of data uh, that can exist that allow engineers. Uh, to be able to say, well, this machine is not running well, but it ran great four years ago. Let's go look at what the settings of that machine was for four years. And so using what we call historians, or, which are basically uh, high-speed SQL databases, we can pull that data and create queries and trends. Uh, I worked on a situation where we had an explosion and we were able to pull the SQL data uh, to map it just uh, right before the explosion to show whether the operator changed some values of that machine. So, you know, one case, you know, water may not do so well with uh, hot molten iron, and that can cause some issues, I think, as you can understand. So in the manufacturing environment, um, Basically, the PLCs, the IOTs are now starting to really intelligently run uh, the plant. There are also issues with IOTs. If you have a network that, for example, you have somebody that hits a switch and kills the power, uh, you're going to lose the, the switch and it comes back up, uh, and you're having uh, you know, poor data, that can cause issues to how your machines are, are running or could put, you know, could create a safety issue uh, for your, your workers. So, you know, this is a very, uh, you know, a, de a delicate environment. Um, it's monitored constantly uh, for, with, with most manufacturing plants. Uh, and what I'll be, you know, doing is showing you that, you know, besides the, uh, the water uh, sewage uh, case in Florida, that hackers can get into uh, PLCs uh, just as you get into computers because PLCs are assigned an IP address. And PLCs, uh, they do store their data. And uh, so 
let's move on to the next slide so we can uh, take a you know closer look. So what I'm stressing here is that you know cyber attacks uh, in manufacturing uh, is getting uh, you know higher in volume, and it's extremely important that manufacturing uh, uh, organizations, companies uh, keep their uh, software, the hardware at the latest, uh, you know, possible, which includes switches. And switches, um, I've seen manufacturing plants putting in the wrong switch. For example, there are you know, what I call back end office switches, like the Cisco's, and you can look at those in your office, and they have nice air vents and so forth. But that may be the type of switch that can cause a horrible accident within a plant. Because if you have a gas leak and that switch is not a sealed switch, um, and again, there's a lot of uh, uh, manufacturers that produce uh, sealed network switches, you're going to have an explosion. And I've, I've seen that happen. So, you know, it's very important that when you're doing forensics that you have a total understanding of that architecture of that network on how it's laid out and designed and what type of equipment uh, they're using. Um, so that's that's key. So if you can hit on the now thing. Uh, okay, good. So what I want to show you is that this is uh, with the, the software program that's running a machine. So we're looking at the PLC logic. And there's uh, several types of uh, logic. This is what we're looking at ladder logic. Uh, and this is widely used, um, the electrician uh, engineer most likely would like prefer, to prefer this. Uh, and you'll see that the code uh, are within those boxes. And so there are so many tools like WW uh, uh, client that once you have the IP address of that PLC that you can you know get into the PLC and make a change if I don't know if you can see that 2000 so that may be uh, you know uh, you know 2000 uh, percentile of of oxygen to gas so if I wanted to be a, a, a bad hacker uh, I could turn that up to a hundred percent and start creating a, a, a unsafe situation of a potential explosion so not that uh, you know, I want to play this lightly. Uh, again, this is educational that, you know, once, you know, PLCs are running off of uh, IP numbers uh, and those PLCs uh, along with IOTs, uh, you know, again, that running your operation, you know, need to be secured uh, in uh, the ability to get to that uh, PLC. And so manufacturing companies are using quite a few. Now, what I'm showing here with this screen is uh, a uh, on the internet. I don't know if you use Shodan. It's s h o d a n dot com, and all you need to do is put in IoT or cameras uh, or VSAT. And what Shodan does, it sends out spiders to all the IPs out there that exist, and it looks for open ports. So this is widely on the internet. Uh, it's scary because you know, putting a VSAT, uh, you know, slash 8080 uh, to get into a certain port, uh, you can get into cameras. And what's scary about it is you can get into ships that are out in sea and actually get into their IoT devices if they're not secure. And this is why I've got to stress on an educational level that, again, you've got to have your software, your hardware uh, and any type of uh, circumference defense systems that you can afford to put in. And I'm saying you, it's basically you cannot afford to, to be lackadaisical about this. And you'll be shocked as to the number of, you know, hundreds of companies that are wide open on the internet. And this is one of the, uh, one, just one of the many sites that hackers uh, will use to get into IOT. Awesome. So Thank, thank you, Norman. I, I, every time I spoke uh, with him in the past, and you know, he talks about explosions. Um, you know, it just takes this whole IoT, in my opinion, to a to a different level. You know, again, I'm looking at it from what I have in my home or what I have in 
in my office or, or company. But then when you talk about its use in industrial and how changing something could have devastating effects um, really should make us all think about um, this a little bit more seriously. Ken, tell us where the data is stored because it seems to be all over the place. Ken, you're, you're muted again. I got it. I got it this there time. You go. No, it's it, only it been really a year is, of doing it, Zooms, Ken. Yeah, it really can be stored in, in many different places. And as you mentioned with the humidor example, you know, you can find some data on local devices. Um, and then, you know, there may, data may be resident in the cloud. It may be in a database application. Uh, it may be on a server somewhere locally in an enterprise. Um, it really depends. And, and one of the things that you really want to, you know, be sensitive to is again, the data may be, um, you know, it may be specific to a time period. So it may only log data for certain periods of time, 24 hours, 48 hours a year. Um, and just because you have the physical device doesn't necessarily mean you have the data. So again, as you mentioned, Warren, with the humidor, you know, you may, if you, if you get the actual physical device, you may get, you know, a certain portion of that, but the resident, the data may reside, you know, wholly um, over a longer period in the cloud or, or in a database somewhere. I wanted to see if anyone in the paddle panel had any comments on possession, custody, and control uh, before Patrick. Um, I uh, asked Patrick to join when he was doing some stuff using a tool that he'll describe um, taking the raw IoT data and making it uh, usable and um, exportable, but um, it, it, again, another aha moment that I had, you know, do you think the IOT data might have it, or, you know, it might be at some edge computer or in the cloud or in a tool that, that, uh, that Patrick's going to talk about those types of tools that, you know, that collect the data and, you know, make it, um, readable. Anyone else have any other um, cautionary tales or, or information on possession, custody, and control? I think there's just some good points on here. Just, you know, really have a clear understanding of what the devices are. And, and you know, sometimes you may have to do some research to have an understanding of whether or not you have to power the device. If there's an issue with, with powering the device on and off or disconnecting it from you know, the, the internet or, or it's interconnected devices. Um, so there's just some sensitivities you have to think about when, you know, considering how to collect the data and whether it's volatile or not. Yeah, and Warren, you were making a point that um, just previously that the data might not be available for a long time. Um, you know, one thing to consider too, as with a lot of this IoT based data, it's, it's more metric driven. Right, like what Norman was talking about, monitoring the health of the different industrial assets that might be on a manufacturing floor, um, or you know, take for instance like a telecom provider um, that might be monitoring, you know, information coming off of set top boxes. Right, the value might not be in the actual events themselves individually, uh, but the value that they're getting out of that data might be in larger amounts of time, right? And so there's, there's tools out there, right? They can do analytics of data flowing over the stream, right? Without it actually being persisted to disk. So the raw events that we're talking about might not ever get preserved anywhere, right? And so these are additional things just to think about in terms of, you know, from a preservation standpoint, and where you're actually looking for data, um, you know, the, as I'll talk about here in a few seconds, like getting data from all these different systems, all these, from all these different devices, there might be five or 10 ways that the data is being streamed into some kind of tool or some kind of storage repository. And just real quick, uh, before I turn it back to Patrick, um, you know, this was an example that our, um, uh, friends at uh, Ryan in Dallas um, shared with me that I thought was pretty cool. Again, 
data that's being collected for not investigative use, but you could take all these different data sources like tolls and GPS data and put it together and then figure out, you know, where the person was, what were they doing, you know, where were they, uh, so on and so forth. And it's pretty cool when you have these analytics tools that could, you know, for the companies, they, they want to know about fuel consumption. But for the investigator, I can now track on a map, you know, where they are, and I could correlate the GPS data with toll data and putting this all together from various sources is, is actually pretty cool. Patrick? Make it sure I uncheck the mute button over here. <laughs> um, yeah, so in coming in and, and just for um, throwing this out there, no warning said, I, I'm specifically speaking about Splunk technologies. I've been an engineer there uh, prior to joining Acres. Um, Splunk is not the only data platform out there. It's a good one. There's other good tools out there that kind of follow the, the same type of construct, right? And these might be tools that in the cases that you're working on, the, the um, your customers, your clients might have them within their environment. So it's something to keep in the back of your mind. But in terms of getting this data in, I mean, there's a number of different mechanisms to get the data, you know, the sensor data coming from the manufacturing floor could be going through like a Kepware or one of the ICS systems that Norman was talking about. Um, there's push methodology, so data streaming directly from the device to some kind of analytics platform. Um, there could be pool-based type data pools where uh, the, the platform could go in and programmatically script out a pool from a database on a specified period or reading data from log files on a specified period. Uh, it, it, the whole point I have in this slide is just, just to illustrate how many different ways there might be to get a data source into another platform. Because I know traditionally in the e-discovery the e uh, context and forensics context, we're typically dealing with static data sets. Um, and so that's where, that's one of the interesting things about these other data platforms is that we're dealing with streaming data coming in real time to do investigations, do alerts, and then, you know, going back to the more industrial kind of use that, that Norman's been talking about, that's one type of use case, right, for these types of platforms. And I'm going to share my screen. Let's see here. Continue. Right, I know we've been talking about explosions and hackers infiltrating water systems, but you know, I figured we could talk about making data delicious for just a few minutes and, and lighten the mood just a little bit. Um, unfortunately, this is what happens when you get a bunch of data nerds together that love to cook and do barbecue. Um, and talking about being able to leverage IoT sensor data for any type of use case, right? So I had a colleague of mine uh, that lives in Kansas City that has basically built a smoke monitoring device with a little Raspberry Pi that he's got in a number of the, the large Kansas City smokehouses, right? And there's actually, he's discovered a, a business benefit to this. So instead of, you know, grandpappy saying, hey, every four minutes we throw four log, or every 30 minutes we throw four logs into our smoker, right, by actually using the data coming off of the sensors, they've been able to tell, well, maybe we throw a log in every hour. So they're seeing a 25 to 30 percent decrease in natural resource consumption just by measuring the quality of the smoke that's coming off of these smoking rigs. And just to give you an example of and I'll, I'll show you kind of a live action demo here, but this is just showing you the type, you know, one possible example of what IoT data could look like when you're actually taking a look at it and doing an analysis. All right, and so here is a, a, a little home Splunk instance that I have set up. So I'm going to walk you guys through just a, some quick samples of some uh, sensor data that I have in my house. So I've got a little Splunk server here that's capturing uh, uh, home automation data from my SmartThings hub. And here, uh, I'm just going to run the search again. So we're just taking a look at the last four hours. And let me move this video so you guys are out of the way. 
And here we can just see some pretty nasty kind of JSON data, but there's a lot of information that's coming in from uh, these events off of these various sensors, right? So if we break this out, we can see, you know, this is a front door sensor that I have. It's given me the temperature um, right now. And depending on the device, there might be different polling periods. Uh, we can see if we wanted to break it down by, okay, I've got my little office sensor right here. Show me all the event data from the last four hours that I'm getting from my office sensor, right? And so, uh, you know, we can see additional data about here. So, I mean, this is just the raw nasty bits that are actually coming from the source. And so, uh, you know, one of the big questions is, is, hey, what's the organization, how are they using this data, right? How are they making decisions based on this data, right? And so I might not be interested in doing analytics or doing an investigation on the raw nasty bits here, right? There might be something that I'm wanting to actually leverage a chart, right? And here's just a quick little um, time chart of the, the raw data we're just looking at, and then I can layer this on, and give me a nice little graph of the event count by the different devices that are reporting in my home. Um, and also another thing, right, and like I was mentioning earlier, right, there's the ability to do this on a, a real-time basis as well. So I've got a sensor, hopefully the motion thing will pick up. But this has given us a 30-second window of the actual uh, devices that are sending data through, um, grab this guy. There we go. Sometimes it takes a little bit to start up. All right, so this is the little uh, sensor that I have next door to my um, my computer right here. It's showing that, hey, there was an acceleration event. There's a polling period on this every 15 or 20 seconds. I mean, so you can actually see data streaming in, right? So here's the humidity reading from this device here. So uh, a lot of different ways to make use of this data, and then going back to the whole security angle of this, especially from a, a home consumer standpoint, uh, you probably don't want to be buying, you know, unknown doorknobs that are smart locks and stuff for your house for, from a vendor that doesn't really have any security <laughs> protocols or anything in place, because it could be an entryway for a hacker to get into your network. Um, Right, and just going back over to show off uh, another kind of lens into this data. So this is taking a look at the, the IoT data that I've got in my house, just in kind of a, a static dashboard type mode. So here we can see, you know, just the event counts by the sensors. So we can see that my office sensors firing off the most events because I've got it tuned to send events more frequently than, than the other sensors in my home. Average house temperature, um, Apparently my office temperature is, uh, my, it, the sensor's off a little bit because if my house is 641 degrees, uh, I think we'd have bigger problems to deal with. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of different ways that you can visualize and do analytics on this, right? And then one of the last things that, um, that Warren was talking about is, you know, these data platforms that are out here are great investigative tools, um, right? So they do have, if, Let's say if you do find a data set that you want to export out to another tool for additional processing or analysis, you know, a lot of these tools do have export capabilities where you can get the raw data out, right, if you wanted to export. But also a lot of the, the platforms that are out there have pretty good um, and pretty advanced query languages that you can get a lot of value out of the, the data that you're looking at. Right, or really do a deep level investigation of the data you're looking at right within the tool itself. And then last but not least, going back to the industrial control side of the house, right? this is just another example of being able to leverage um, IoT type data within uh, your, your clients or your customers environments that they might have systems like Norman's, or they're probably having systems like Norman's that are there and then uh, just like what I'm showing you guys, here's an example of um, Lockheed Martin uh, where they're actually using Splunk as one of their platforms or tools to, to get data from their ICS systems on their floor for like predictive maintenance type use cases and being able to keep the, the health of their systems online so they can keep working on the, uh, the new F-35 fighter jets. So a lot of uh, very interesting things that you can do with data once, once you're capturing it.
and this could be on prem or it could be in the cloud, like going back to what we were talking about before, where's this data going to live? And so that's something to keep in mind on where, when you're trying to track it down. And to Patrick's point, um, that he just made was, was pretty, pretty good about, you know, what you could do with the data if it's being stored, but as you know, a consultant and I'm sure others, um, that are viewing or consultants as well, or, or maybe you work internally and you don't know that that Splunk's being used for this. Knowing about the existence is what, you know, hopefully uh, we're sharing with you, you know, to broaden our horizons beyond, as I said earlier, you know, it's not just the thermostat on the, on the wall. It's not just the doorbell or the, or the camera that's the IOT. I mean, companies are running on this data, running using these devices, and the data is being stored someplace. We need to find it. Patrick, uh, other than just saying, hey, do you use Splunk? If someone walks in and they're trying to help uh, an organization, what are some keywords or who should they be talking to to find out if they're using these types of tools? And Norman, you know, you as well, um, any keywords or anything that they should be looking at? You know, we used to do custodian questionnaires and we would say, do you use email? Well, yeah, everyone uses email these days. Do you use a cell phone? Well, yeah. You know, what kind, what, what can we be asking for is, is my question. Norman, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, in, within the manufacturing world, I think the key thing is first understanding what your architecture is, what your network is, uh, looking at the switches, uh, talking with the uh, corporate IT uh, team as to what type of uh, perimeters are they using, uh, like logic monitor, uh, and you know various other types of tools to help harden uh, the attack surface, uh, and then start taking an onion layer approach as to uh, if you're working with the IOTs, what are they connected to? How do you update those? What's the firmware update release? Uh, what's the most current release? Uh, in other words, onion uh, layer approach on the uh, key uh, devices, also working with uh, just not the IT people, um, but working with the electrical engineers that may be working with PLCs. Um, how do you update this? You know, how do you download? How do you up, uh, upload the uh, product? Also, uh, looking at the manufacturer, uh, if you're looking at, say, a corrupt uh, software that's been changed, uh, a lot of times there's footprints, uh, for example, uh, Rockwell will have the uh, login name of the operator that uploaded or downloaded that software. Um, that will give you, you know, a, a tip. So basically, okay. uh, you know, onion layering it, uh, turning every single stone as you do in a typical uh, forensic investigation uh, group and putting together. If you have the data, as I pointed out, um, you know, trying to map out a historical uh, trend as to what happens uh, of the settings of a particular machine or instance. Uh, let's say if you have a uh, machine that makes Coca-Cola cans, um, you know, what was the speed setting at of the conveyor belt? Oh, look, it changed from, you know, from 60 to 200. Um, you know, who was the operator that oversaw that? And start getting the operators, start asking those typical questions of, 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 of occurrence, much like ask, what ask probably questions. occurred. Yeah. You know, ask questions and listen um, to things that hopefully investigators can do a lot of. Um, I want to ask Trey, um, I, I was talking to Trey about my problem, my personal problem with my, my alarm system and my camera. And I said, Trey, how do we get all of this data from people's personal IOT and, and make use of it. Um, so I don't know, Trey, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff you've been doing? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, 
I know we've been talking about industrial, uh, you know, pieces, but trying to relate it back to maybe something, you know, people might see a little bit more often, especially when they're looking at, you know, mobile devices and what's being synced. I know we talked about it a little bit earlier as far as, you know, what's being stored in the cloud versus what, you know, is going to be local on that handset. Uh, you know, let's talk about Ring for a little bit. So, Obviously, Ring was acquired by Amazon back in April of 2018. So when we speak of Ring, we're speaking of Amazon. So right off the bat, we know there's probably going to be a lot of cloud data, you know, for that. Um, what I wanted to highlight here, you know, there is some good news, especially for law enforcement. There, are, you know, is access to logs and the community opt-in programs that Ring provides where once you have that access, you can gleam, um, you know, potentially other videos from other sources that are kind of all being compiled in that community program. I'll kind of show you what that looks like here in just a little bit. And then down here uh, in the screenshot I took, uh, the BBC actually made a data subject uh, access request or DSAR into what information uh, ring weight uh, collects and the period of time that they collected from was the end of September of 2019 through February of 2020 for a doorbell and then at the end they added in a, a the video system as well but for that you know fairly short time period there were over 1900 individual events being recorded and captured in this log um, you know things from motion being activated by the sensors uh, as you can see the event kind uh, column to things such as the ding, which obviously is the doorbell um, a piece of that as well. So you're going to have an idea of what's going on, uh, along with you might see one that says on demand, which is going to be somebody you know remotely accessing the ring doorbell to view what's going on or to speak to somebody outside. And then obviously that event ID that's uh, pretty helpful as well. Now, obviously, that's kind of what you're seeing in some of those logs. I'm going to share my screen very quickly here. Give me just one second. And there we go. Warren, can you see my screen okay? Yep. Perfect. So what I wanna show, I've got a iOS device that I made a file system level image of uh, looking at that ring doorbell just to see what we can get. And one thing I always wanna point out to people, you know, look and see what people are doing on their devices. That's gonna tell you on the apps that you might need to dig into to start. So I'm actually gonna go into operating system here, just scroll on down to the Knowledge C database, which obviously, you know, you're gonna get 28 to 30 days of a snapshot of that device history and get that pattern of life usage, which is so critical for, you know, really pinpointing the different apps that you need to dig into here. Uh, so that being said, I'm going to look at the Knowledge Sheet application, uh, you know, usage uh, piece. So give me one second, application usage. And as I'm looking here, this is a great start to understand different applications that, you know, that user is touching. So we can see, you know, passbook. So they might have been in their wallet, weather, Instagram, mail, Facebook, Starbucks. Okay, keep going down. And now you start seeing things like ring. So that's telling me right off the bat, okay, this is something I might want to dig into a little bit more. So, you know, a good first step of when you're looking to figure out where you need to pinpoint that investigation, you know, for digging into that. Now, other places that we, we might want to look into, especially when it comes to Ring and what's being stored on this device, is actually going to be within the Knowledge C as well. And that's going to be the Knowledge C notification usage, which is down here. Now, why is this important? Well, Ring gives you those notifications if somebody is at your door or rings your doorbell, things along those lines. And as we're looking through here, you know, what can we see? Well, we have Apple shortcuts. We can see low power mode. We do see we have notifications from Ring as well. Now, the reason this is important is because what's being stored on this device is often just going to be from the cache of what is going on and what you've interacted with within that app. So you're going to have an idea based on the notifications that, hey, maybe they click on it, they were able to log in, and that cached uh, something to this device that could be important. The other thing I want to call attention to very quickly here is the apple.shortcuts. Now, this is obviously an app that's built within iOS now. Um, its predecessor was a third-party app, uh, if this, then that. That. That's something that a lot of IoT devices kind of connected to in the early days. And essentially, you can build, you know, if, for instance, my thermostat goes above 70, uh, you know, the AC will cut on. Or, you know, you can build more complex ones. If my AC comes on, then I want my lights to cut off. And you can keep building out these workflows. And Shortcuts does the same thing. So that tells me right away as well from here that, hey, they're probably doing something within Shortcuts I might want to dig into. Now, to find that ring data, there's a couple different ways we can do this. 
I'm just gonna go up to mobile very quickly here and we can go into the installed applications. Now, a couple of quick ways of being able to do this here, we could just, uh, and I like to move this display name over to that package name so I can see what's going on from this point. We could just start scrolling through and looking through. We could actually come in and build a, you know, a complex filter saying, hey, I want to remove anything from the com.apple because Apple uses the reverse domain structure. So you see only the third party apps or even easier, you can just do filter on the column of the display name, just type in ring. So if you want a full listing of all the third party apps, you can do that. Or if you're looking for something very specific, you can use this as your road map. And here we can see we have ring. Uh, we definitely have it installed. When I select that information, this is your roadmap now to find out where that data resides on this device. So we have the GUID that we can copy and paste. Now from here, I can just hop over to the file system view to start looking at that. And when I do that, we can start seeing what is embedded within the data structure of this app. And when I'm scrolling through here, I'm going to kind of start at the top here. As you can see, I've already got the filter turned on for this. And, you know, as we're going through here, the first thing that kind of caught my eye when I was looking at this is this uh, phone one log. And I, I got really excited about it thinking, oh, hey, this is going to be a log of all the interactions and everything that's going on. Unfortunately, it's not going to be that exciting. It's going to have a lot of just noise as far as what's going on on that device at any given time. It's going to have like, uh, you know, it's going to be checking the network and making sure the speeds of the network, uh, you know, from time to time and just basic information in there. So not super, super helpful when you're really trying to get an understanding of what's going on. Um, but when you kind of keep digging through here, we can see the com.ring plist, which I always tell people, if you're looking at Mac or iOS, always look for that main plist that you can start digging into, you know, to get some information potentially about the user account or what's going on. And it's gonna have things, you know, I'm gonna pop this out so we can see a little bit better here. You know, the last time that, you know, there was an interaction with, uh, you know, the ring and, you know, some of those bits and pieces. So I always tell people kind of check this to see what's going on. You can also see here, you know, with the shortcuts and the new shortcuts, all of these are showing as empty. So there's nothing else uh, really being uh, used from within ring, um, but just good information to have. You can also see here the, uh, the ding tracking service. Now, if you notice that number is eerily uh, similar to the number that was in the event ID from what I was showing on the PowerPoint earlier. So you kind of have a, a event ID that you can start tracking back from with some of this information. And as we keep scrolling down, you can also see, hey, we have the ID and we also have a date of when that happened. So once again, starting to narrow your investigation down. Now for law enforcement, uh, if you are requesting information from Ring specifically, really the fastest way to get reliable information is have the MAC address, if at all possible, of that device. And you can either go into the Ring application of your you know, victim or suspect and go under devices and pull that information. If you have access to the Ring device itself, you can look on the back of the doorbell, the security cameras, uh, the MAC address actually located near the power cord near the rear mount uh, as well. Or if you can find the box as well, that's always great. But that will expedite uh, you getting that information back and making sure it's the right information as well. Now, a couple of other pieces of information I wanna scroll through here, you know, as we're scrolling through, we can see we have an MP4 here. Uh, once again, we can come in, we can click play. And something that's important here is the community aspect that I was talking about at the very beginning of, you know, allowing to opt in uh, to this. Well, this video was actually part of that community alert system. And I did in fact look at that video on the device under the community setting, and it did cache to my device. But this is the type of information that you might be to pull as a law enforcement officer, you know, from the community-based uh, aspect of this. But once again, it did a cache since I looked at it on my device. Now, as I keep scrolling through here, we do have the cache DD. Once again, thought I might get lucky when I was looking at this, thinking, hey, I got the full maybe uh, database of information that could be important in here. And, you know, when I open this up, you can see there's a lot of binary P list. Now we could always right click and view those P list as well, but honestly, not too, too much there. Looking at some of this other information, we can see, you know, the uh, cache response list, you know, and see what some of that information is. And this could be handy because this is actually showing some of, uh, you know, the searches and what I was looking for and kind of digging into. Um, now, obviously, I have tried pulling out some of these uh, URLs to see what would happen. It didn't really go anywhere. 
but you do get a timestamp and getting some idea of you know, some of the integrations and some of the alerts that are happening off this device. Here's a video search history and when I did that as well. So a little, you know, little bit of information to kind of start piecing uh, some of this together. As I keep uh, scrolling through here, you can see I've got a PNG, uh, you know, that's selected. Now, obviously, some of these you can do quick previews on. Here you can see it's just a quick snapshot of what was being viewed at that given time on that ring doorbell when you uh, activated it live. You can see there's a lot of pictures and videos on here as well. And, you know, keep going down through. Here you can see there was actually an alert on the device. I clicked on the notification. What happened? It went to a live view and I got a picture of the kid making faces at the doorbell, uh, which I thought was pretty funny because that's what it cached from the live video. Uh, you know, as we keep looking through here, as you can see, there's a lot of data that's within this app uh, set. And then we have a bunch of these files. And when I click on some of these, you can see this is actually going to be a JSON, and we do have a built-in JSON viewer from within Axiom. And when I open this information up, what can we see? Well, we have timestamps. We have the ding ID. So once again, um, that alert that we can cross-reference for if we are having to collect information from, um, you know, directly from Amazon slash ring for this. So you can see what's going on. You can also see, hey, did they favorite that video? Because when you log into the ring portal online, you can favorite videos. You can see the duration of what was going on there as well. And then you can see, hey, was this alerted through Alexa? Was this an auto reply? Did they find a person as a part of this as well? So, you know, some pretty good information that you can cross reference with the ability to pull some of those additional pieces is when you get your search warrant or when you do a collection and you log into that ring account because you can see a lot of this information when you log in as well it's just not saved directly to that device so i always you know recommend kind of looking through and you know I, as you can see we have a lot of json files here but making sure that you're kind of digging into that so that when you go to request information from these providers you can be very detailed as far as hey you want you know that specific ding id uh, and as much information about that as possible uh, with this uh, but that's definitely just a uh, you know, piece of what I wanted to show today. But uh, Warren, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome. Tri uh, thanks, Trey. Appreciate it. Um, I hope that uh, the attendees, you know, like we said earlier, we were here to raise the awareness uh, beyond IoT just being for home use. Um, we will now jump over to the Discord for... Uh, some Q&A. Please join us there. Thank you for joining the presentation, and we look forward to seeing you at the Discord. Thanks, everyone.